just waiting for the confirmation that recording. Yeah, so recording is running now. Um, all be aware you, you're being recorded. And with that, I would like to open our uh, September instance of the community call. Great to see so many people here, despite vacation time and whatnot. Um, and yeah, I'm especially excited this time to have a presenter not from Siemens. Up to now, we typically had like internal presentations. This time, time we actually have um, a company presenting that I've been, yeah, I think in contact with now for about a year, I think, mm -hmm. Semantic Arts. And uh, there's even running activities in, in some places at Siemens. We might hear about them today, not sure. Yeah, and so I'm really happy to present uh, to, or to introduce Dave, um, who will be talking today about current trends that they are experiencing when it comes to basically deploying semantic technologies in large enterprises. Dave, thanks for presenting and your stage. <laughs> Great, thank you. Let me just uh, do that, and you can see my. Uh, Screen there? Yep. Great. Okay. There's our topic. So I suppose no uh, presentation about trends would be complete without a, whoops, where's my mouse? Without a Gartner hype cycle. And I, uh, <clears throat> I just saw this one, although it's from 2020. You guys know the Gartner hype cycle. They, they say, oh, technology and trends start down there on the left and then they get extremely hyped and then they fall into this trough of disillusionment. Um, so the artificial intelligence guys are saying the knowledge graphs are right there. It's like when you're on a roller coaster and you're right at the top and oh my God, we're about to plunge into. But meanwhile, the data management folks say, no, no, we're already at the bottom of the trough. Although if you look carefully, when I first looked at this, I thought it was the same thing. At the top was knowledge graphs and down at the bottom is graph databases. And, you know, if you're if you're in the part of the industry that we're in, those are synonymous. There are parts of the industry where those are not synonymous and maybe um, Gartner had actually teased apart that subtle distinction. But that, that gives you sort of an idea of, of, of at least what Gartner thinks. And, and literally yesterday, I got another hype cycle with them for 2021, a different sector. I forgot what sector it was now. Forgot to include it, but back there at the top of the hype cycle. Um, so we're going we're gonna to start with that backdrop, but I think we're going to get a little, a little more interesting, a little more nuanced than that. What I, what I really want to do is figure out, you know, what is going on? What, what, what has Gartner thinking were peak hype, peak peak drop, not drop, disillusionment, et cetera. So let me uh, preface what I'm about to say with just a little bit about me and where my opinions come from, because pretty much everything you're going to hear now is strictly my opinion, but it's a slightly informed opinion, I, I hope. Um, <clears throat> I founded this company, Semantic Arts, in the year 2000. Uh, we had been doing some semantic work in the 90s, uh, not using semantic web standards because literally I thought this was such great timing in 2001, you know, Tim Bursley and, and Handler and, and Ora Lassley uh, printed that article in, in Scientific American that pretty much launched the semantic web. And we thought, oh, great, you know, the guy that launched the World Wide Web now launched the semantic web. We got it made. We're just going to paddle out in front of this big wave, and and we paddled out and just sat there and sat there and sat there. Like nothing happened for quite a while. We just we just did traditional IT, except we were doing semantics in the background. Every one of our projects had a semantic spin, but but nobody was buying it. I then decided to write a book on semantics. It was called Semantics and Business Systems. It was just making the case for why business systems actually are deeply rooted in meaning. Still nobody's biting. We launched, co-launched co with uh, Dataversity, the Semantic Technology Conference in 2005 and ran that for nearly 
10 years, we got to know pretty much everybody who's in this industry because everybody would come to that conference for, for all that time. And right in the, somewhere in the middle of that, we, we, people were starting to pick up on semantics. We, they were asking for enterprise ontologies. You know, we had work in our field, but then we noticed that none of it was getting implemented. You know, we would design something and it would sit on a shelf. So starting seven or eight years ago, we, we decided we were going to have to hold people's hands and, and help them um, get these things implemented, make them real. And somewhere in that process, I started learning and, and, and made some observations about what's really going on in the, in the software industry. I wrote a book called Software Wasteland, which pretty much points out why the entire enterprise IT industry is in a very stuck place and why they why they stay stuck. Uh, and it's gotten reasonably well received. And then the follow on to that is is what's the way out? And we call it the data centric revolution, but it's very much semantics based as we'll as we'll talk about in a minute. So that's kind of that's kind of my journey, how I got to here. Um, semantic arts, you know, all we've done for 21 years was projects that involved semantics and knowledge graphs in one way or another. Um, we've built at least 50 enterprise ontologies and have you know, gathered a, a lot of, of, of insight from that process. There's 25 of us, which is probably one of the largest collections of ontologists anywhere. You guys might have a few more, but you're a gigantic company, more concentrated anyway. And we, uh, created the, sort of a byproduct of all this work. We kept, every time we'd see a new enterprise ontology, we'd think a little bit more about what was common between uh, enterprises. And that has been distilled into an enterprise ontology or a upper ontology called GIST, which is free. It's freely, it's on our website, freely available. Anyone can go download it. Um, <clears throat> here's companies that whose names you likely recognize that we've done, you know, some kind of major, whoops, major project for. Um, and as Thomas suggested, th this slide is either companies whose names you'd recognize, like your own, but where we've only done a small bit of work or some advisory work, or in some cases, we've done more work, but it's a company you would have never heard of. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag, but just to give you sort of a sense of, you know, it's in every industry, <laughs> Got several religious groups, governments, it's all over the place. Um, so we're not specialized in any one industry. And just so it wouldn't be entirely my own opinion, I, I you know, I read a lot, I research a lot, and I also, I think these are three uh, pretty worthwhile thought leaders to pay attention to and who's, some of whose material I've, I've snagged for parts of this presentation. Starting with uh, Alan Morrison, who uh, was with PwC, he's now uh, independent, does a lot of uh, writing and researching on this topic. And he made this observation that nine of the 10 largest by market cap companies in the world now are known users and or uh, very bought into to knowledge graphs. Uh, and interesting, as we'll see in a minute, Many of them got into this about 10 years ago. So they, it, it's just now becoming kind of widely accepted that, that, that they're deep users of this and, and they're getting a lot of advantage for it. And it means they have a 10 year head start on a lot of other people that are just coming along. Uh, and let's, you know, let's start with the, the granddaddy of mall, Google. You know, how did Google get to become what it is and it's it's a it's a fascinating story i i read both some of their early uh funding proposals and um and even at at, at the time of their ipo with well, an interesting little t they went public in 2004. um interestingly probably one of their most prescient uh acquisitions was in 2003 they acquired a company interestingly named Applied Semantics, which is where AdSense came from. In fact, when Google was first launched, they really had no revenue model at all. They had 
two things they were talking about doing. One was licensing their software to people like Yahoo, and the other was uh, they were going to sell devices. In fact, they made a few of them, these yellow colored rack mounted enterprise search things, which they had sold literally millions of dollars worth, but nothing like anything like this. Really, um, a lot of their growth kickstarted there in, in, in 2003. Then they made another uh, interesting acquisition, a company called MetaWeb. Um, and we're going to uh, I'll mention them a little bit later on. When we talked about linked open data, but they had they had set up shop in front of uh, DBpedia and, and a lot of the linked open data web and had curated that, turned it into a, a very large uh, RDF knowledge graph uh, and, and a product called Freebase. Um, <clears throat> so Google acquires them in 2010, pretty much re-engineered it, but it, it re-emerged as uh, you know what we now know as the is the Google Knowledge Graph. And what, there, there's a quite a profound difference that, that occurred there. It used to be when you type something into a Google homepage, you'd get the best document they could find. I mean, they were literally searching for keywords, giving you documents, and their uh, claim to fame was, was that it was a better ranking because, you know, it was waiting incoming links. But, but still really just searching for documents like every other document management system has ever done. But once they got the knowledge graph behind there and could start interpreting what, what did they actually mean? And when you type in something as innocuous as UA1409, they know that that's probably United Airlines flight 1409. Um, happens to be going from Houston to Fort Myers, but, um, and you're not interested in a whole bunch of documents that might mention that. You want to know this, you know, it's on time, it's going out of C, terminal C, gate C2. You know, that's the, the kind of interesting, profound difference that just sort of snuck up on us, I think. Meanwhile, Facebook, right from its inception, it is a graph, it's a social, you know, social network. Um, and in the early days, they had an API where you could get this information as RDF triples. Um, I, I haven't really checked lately, but I think they got in a lot of trouble. Cambridge Analytics sucked a lot of that data out and messed with elections, and they've been under a lot of criticism. But I mean, there's no question but that behind the scenes, there's a gigantic knowledge graph there. Same with Microsoft, LinkedIn, pretty much all these these. Um, very large firms are, you know, fundamentally knowledge graphs underneath. And uh, and Siri, actually Siri um, had their coming out party at, at our conference, the Semantic Technology Conference, right when Apple was acquiring Siri. Um, and it was probably one of the first uh, RDF based knowledge graph kind of companies. So that's my uh, trend number one is pretty much all of the, the companies that everyone envies, I suppose, um, are knowledge graph based, and that is attracting a lot of attention. The second trend I wanna to point to is kind of in a, in a slightly different direction, the, the linked open data, and what does that mean for an enterprise? So back in about 2007 or eight, the Free University of Berlin. You guys probably know some of these people, Professor Aaron and or Ara, and several others looked at Wikipedia, and and they probably said, "Gee, it'd be kind of neat to to turn all that data into into a knowledge graph." But at the time, natural language processing struggled with with unstructured text, but there were these these info boxes over there on the right, in this case, Morgan Stanley, it's a type of company and it's traded and it's in an industry and all that kind of stuff. And they looked at it and I said, you know, we could scrape that. We could go grab, you know, the, the topic, call that a, a URI, and every key value pair there is really Think of the key as the predicate and the and the thing on the right as the object. And if it's in blue, it's a 
it's an object type property. If it's in if it's in black, it's a literal. I mean, it was really kind of that <clears throat> that straightforward. Harvested all that data, put it in put it in DVP, and put a Sparkle front end on the on the public website. And but I think the the innovation there was two innovations. One, there's a feedback loop. Back when they first did this, those info boxes were horrible. There was no normalization. Everything was misspelled. Things sometimes were numbers and sometimes weren't. It was all, but but when, once people started noticing that people were actually consuming this data, um, <clears throat> that sort of cleaned it up. And the other thing was just having this public endpoint, people started consuming it. People, you know, uh, one of the people that spoke at our conference was Walmart, and they were talking about how how they use DVPedia. They they made a copy of it. You can certainly make a copy. It's all it's all free <clears throat> because they noticed their search was getting uh, not the results they wanted. People would type in at the time they would type in Green Lantern, and Walmart would serve them up lanterns that happened to be painted green, but DVPedia knows no 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 Green Lantern is this movie comic book hero that people want t-shirts with green lantern on them they don't want actual green lanterns but anyway what then happened was so there's this this core of data that's expressed in rdf and it's got all the uris and it's all properly linked and it's got an ontology <clears throat> some other folks started saying well we could connect with that because because that's what uris are all about they're globally unique identifiers that can be linked and and you know, first it was geo names and friend of a friend and music brains and stuff. But then when the U.S. Census and, and the World Factbook from the CIA started getting involved and Project Gutenberg, all of a sudden people are saying, wow, that's actually pretty cool. Look at what look at what you can do. You can federate. And then it starts growing and growing. And of course, by 2017, it, you know, a lot of this is bioscience. There's a huge amount of, of uh, pharmacological data and stuff out there. I'm, hundreds of billions, maybe even trillions by now, triples. And one thing that, that firms have been doing is, is you know, here's a, a resource. Um, much of this is free. Some of it's behind paywall. Some of it's behind, you know, you need to register. But, but still, um, a, a incredible wealth of data. But I think the more interesting trend is that companies look at this and say, wait a minute, if you could align this much disparate data, everything from music brains to the human genome, why don't we just do this to our own data? Which I think is, is what um, has inspired a lot of what's happening in enterprises now. <clears throat> and life sciences is certainly leading the charge here, but <clears throat> everybody's getting in on it. So that's it. You know, once once they, once I think a, the light bulb goes off when people see, hey, wait a minute, look at how all it's combined. They say, you know, we have a bunch of stuff that's about as diverse as that. Would that work for us? And of course, it turns out, yes, it does. You can take unstructured and structured and warehouses and silos and all kinds of stuff as long as as you get it properly converted to RDF, as long as you can get the URIs to align, if you have a sensible ontology, um, you can really make some incredible progress here. So that's the second trend. And the third one, and the one I'm probably going to spend the most time with, is, is how is this taking root and growing in enterprises? <clears throat> and there's a there's an outfit out there, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Enterprise Knowledge Graph Foundation, but they're you know, helping promote a lot of this. They have a an early draft, it's not completed or published yet, of of their maturity model. You know, it's just like a data maturity and all the other maturity models that are out there, although this is for knowledge graph adoption. And they have names for the for the various stages. Um, I've actually put my own names here. There's there's shorter and simpler and easier to remember and easier to talk about but they they pretty much line up there's there's companies that are doing proof of concepts they're doing pilot projects there's the build out uh then bau is business as usual and then optimizing i think that pretty much aligns with where they were trying to go with this <clears throat> and here's kind of my 
observation. Almost everyone is doing a proof of concept or many proofs of concept. We were at we were at one client. They they called their proof of concept pox. They were doing so many of oh we got a pox for this and a pox for that, but they were starting to realize the the futility of all these proofs of concepts. They one of them said you know it finally occurred to us that we could tell a vendor you know to go do a pox and prove that you could turn the sky purple. And they'd go away for a few months and they come back and we'd look up and we go, oh my God, the sky is purple. That's incredible. But what are we going to do with a purple sky? And you know, that's kind of the problem with, with so many um, proof of concepts is, is somebody can get a vendor all excited and go do something, but then they can't make the connection between what was just proven uh, and, and actually getting something going. And of course, the other problem is most of this stuff doesn't need proving. It's in it's in production all over the place. I don't think I don't think it's it's not like NASA has to prove exotic things that have never been done before. This is just plain old, you know, data processing. Um, there's a huge drop off, though, to the number of people that are actually doing pilots that have something in production, solving a business problem using knowledge graphs and an even bigger drop off. A lot of times you can get a pilot going, but then trying to get that uh, more widely adopted in the enterprise. I mean, there's all kinds of problems, many of which are political, and we're going to talk about them a little bit, some of which are technical. Uh, that will probably resonate a bit more, but we really have to have to solve both kinds of problems there. So and then and there's virtually almost nobody where knowledge no large company where knowledge graph data centric is business as usual meaning that of course any new project that comes along will just do it natively on the graph there's going to be a debate we have to go buy a package or do something in the cloud or software as a service all that stuff and and uh, nobody that i know of that's that's in this optimizing and, and in fact, in all these maturity models, nobody ever gets to the end anyway. So, but anyway, getting from proof of concept to pilot isn't isn't too difficult. That's italics there. Um, but the real issue is that that makes it hard is you actually have to have a sponsor on the business side with a problem to solve and a willingness. You know, there's lots of people with problems to solve, but almost everybody wants to do it the way they've always done it. You have to have some kind of willingness to try something new. So, you know, the what 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 we say constitutes a good pilot is a real problem that it, that you don't have a very good way to solve currently in production. So it's actually doing some use and is going to be around for a while. And the other trick, and and this is more to set it up to go to the next stage, is how are you balancing long term needs and, and, and the evolution of the platform with solving the problem at hand. Um, our strategy for doing that, our methodology, we call it think big, start small, which says, and, and we kind of came to this accidentally. Once upon a time, we only did enterprise ontologies. We thought that was the hard part of the problem. And if you could get that right, everything would fall in place. But we discovered just doing an ontology didn't get anything implemented. Meanwhile, we were observing, <coughs> excuse me, other companies who just do things agilely, and they just said, "Well, we got to we got to do something in a few months and start small and break things and all that." But our observation was, if that if that's all you do, then it's just another silo. It's a semantic silo, but it's a silo. You really have to do these two things in concert, such that this first domain or first problem you solve is future proof and fits into the bigger picture and can can evolve out. And I think that's really the setup for moving to the next stage, which is, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do you take your pilot and and grow it? And I'm, I'm going to speak a, a bit about this because I think this is probably the most it is 
it is the trend, but it's a trend that's not going to go on its own. It has to be kind of nudged along. And really, it really involves three things going on simultaneously as we're kind of discovering. You need a sponsor, and and this kind of spawn, the, the, you needed a sponsor for the pilot, but this is a sponsor who's perhaps going to bet their career on this. They're, they're looking what they think is going to happen over the next five or 10 years. And if they're perceived as being uh, in front of that, that that's, you know, all kinds of, of great things are going to be bestowed on them. Uh, and it's, and it's very often not, you know, it's not, at least for the company's word, you know, not coming from the CEO or even the COO. It's, it's coming from interesting and hard to predict places, but uh, it's that, it's that kind of idea. I've got a slide or two on that, but in parallel with that, we need to be building out the ontology and the architecture. And you guys uh, are familiar with the ontologies and all that. I'm, I'm sure we'll just say a word or two about that. I really want to talk more about how you have to evolve your architecture, how at least our clients are evolving it. So the sponsor is, <clears throat> is the, the owner of the long-term vision. It's trying to figure out what does our enterprise look like as we gradually more and more adopt this knowledge graph approach and, and, and the whole idea of, of sharing data rather than hoarding it. It's a, it's a huge thing to get over because the, the, what, we've, what we've evolved over the last 20 or 30 years is kind of a culture of hoarding. I mean, it's not intentional, but it's sort of what happened because, because of all these silos. One of our other clients has this great phrase that says this needs to be a self-funding journey. In other words, this is not a big bang project that you do like putting an SAP or something like that. This is, this is a modest amount of effort over a long period of time, but it has to continually be paying out. In other words, you have to be able to People have to look at it, the sponsors say, oh yeah, I'm now able to do something I wasn't able to do before. Let's keep going and keep going. And then the other thing one of our, one of our clients is doing, they put together this thing they call a consortium, um, which is a, rather than a top-down data governance, uh, you know, thou shalt do these things, they're finding that it's, it's more productive to have this collaborative environment bringing people together, you have to have some skin in the game and you get to uh, have a voice at the table to evolve the ontology, uh, but you get a lot of good from that. And that's sort of how the, the footprint um, spreads through the, through the firm. The second bit is the enterprise ontology. I think our, our uh, point of departure, perhaps with a lot of other people, there's a lot of people who who advocate a single model, but the data fabric people are quite happy to have a single complex model. You know, thousands or tens of thousands of, of, of attributes is, is just fine. In fact, it's a huge improvement over the millions of attributes they're currently trying to, mo to, to manage, but, but we're advocating not only a single one, but a simple one. Um, you know, there's the people promoting data mesh now, uh, I, I think they have a lot of good ideas, but they're not promoting a single model. They're saying a single model per domain, which is an improvement over a single model per application, but it's not the same as having a single simple model. And then part of what makes this work is the fact that it's extensible. You know, a single simple model doesn't solve everyone's problems, but that shared bit is what holds it all together and the extensions are, are what, you know, makes it work for the individual departments or divisions. <clears throat> and then I'm going to spend a bit more time on the architecture that's that's needed because this kind of gradually comes to be known as, as you start doing this. Obviously, it, it, it is literally possible to become data centric without a graph database. Um, one of our clients without our help, we sort of accidentally became their client. Uh, they've been working on this for 20 years and have a, a very mature data centric architecture originally based on relational database. Um, but that's the hard way to do it. We've never, and, and 
It's, it's the Standard & Poor's Market Intelligence Division. Everything they do is to this one architecture, and they've done a beautiful job of it, but they're the only people I've ever seen um, do this well without a graph database. The architecture also needs to support federation. Um, the idea of continually putting more and more stuff in a, in a central location um, obviously runs out of gas at a performance level and a, and a security level and a lot of levels. I, th I think you really have to, after the, you know, the pilot, obviously, you can easily do without federation. You can do several projects without federation, but eventually you have to say that there's federation is in our future. And we're big advocates of the model driven approach, which says most of most applications can be built without any application code. Um, that, that not only can you create a model that describes what a screen should look like, what a transaction should do, what a constraint is, et cetera, but that that model itself can be triples in the triple store. And you start seeing how, you know, you get all kinds of referential integrity. A lot of, of huge benefits come going down that route, not the least of which was ease of evolution and speed and, and, and reduction of bugs and all kinds of stuff. So here's kind of how we see this playing out typically, that, that in this little green Chevron, people just build a, what they often call a core model. It's, it's the beginning of their enterprise ontology. <clears throat> and all that does, and then get their own data loaded into it. And all it does is prove that you can represent the very complex data you have in your existing applications in a much simpler structure without losing any of the fidelity. And that's a, it doesn't sound like much, but it's a, it's a huge deal because when, when that coin starts to drop, you realize, oh, I can have simplicity and fidelity at the same time. So then what starts to happen and where probably most of the triple store vendors are now is uh, graph analytics, you know, if I can get all this in one place and, and I have a lot of power of graph, I can do things they can't do with a traditional warehouse. This is essentially better than the warehouse I currently have. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. But up to the blue, everything is read only. It's like a data warehouse, you know, data warehouses are, are really read only and they're dependent on upstream systems feeding them data. Um, that nobody actually writes transaction systems against a data warehouse or a data lake or anything like that, or even an analytic graph database. You can get a lot of value out of this, but I think in some ways the, the biggest leap is where they first start saying, wait a minute, there's, a, there's acid transactions, there's everything I need. I could start writing code directly against the knowledge graph. And Initially, most of our clients write very traditional looking apps. It's all JSON and, and, and JavaScript and stuff like that. And they're, and they're treating the knowledge graph almost like a relational database. They do the Sparkle queries and get a table back and stuff. But that's fine because it's the, it's the beginning of understanding what's possible. Then the, the next big leap is, is beginning to have things that are model driven, which allows you to do a lot of those sort of trivial applications that every enterprise has. You know, most large enterprises have many thousands of apps, at least half of which are pretty trivial, you know, that, that are just a series of forms and some reports and a few rules, a little of this, a little of that, Not, no sophisticated analytic modeling. In fact, if there is analytics, you can do it back there in the blue Chevron. Um, you know, it's the it's the tool crib system or it's the return system or it's the, uh, you know, training database. All those kinds of things are just a, a series of pretty simple forms that are a benefited by using a simple shared model and could be implemented, uh, you know, citizen developer kind of things. I mean, you guys use Mendix in sort of in this way. And then the, 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 I think where it really gets interesting is when you mature that enough to say, wait a minute, there isn't anything I'm doing in this huge complex legacy system I just implemented for $100 million that I couldn't do 
in a few hundred uh, model driven apps and maybe a few pages of bespoke code. Uh, and once you realize that, you say, I finally have an approach to legacy modernization. Not the big bang, replace one legacy system with another legacy system, which is what everyone's doing now, but the let's let's peel it apart a little bit at a time because by this point, you've got most of the data of the firm in the model, and it's merely a matter of, of replacing uh, some data uh, sourcing that was coming through the legacy system to just source it more locally and eventually just turn off even pieces at a time parts of your legacy uh, environment. So I think this is the, the, the real journey. But the other thing, because large firms are so large, it doesn't actually happen exactly like that. What really happens is you have to have each of these things is, is a capability, essentially. And once you have the capability, you start rolling it out. So many of our clients, you know, they build a core model and extend it in one domain and then another domain and another. And they want to roll it out as much as they can. But maybe they make some progress, you know, to the right there. Let's let's do some graph analytics, start rolling that out. Let's start building apps. So it's a it's really a, it's kind of moving in two directions simultaneously. Or maybe this is another way to look at it. We, we did this for one of our clients. You do this initial project, which just has a tiny bit of architecture. You know, in fact, it's usually architecture you can borrow. It's just a community edition triple store running in a sandbox. But then as you, as you start going to the right, you're either rolling out different domains and or in parallel building up your infrastructure and and the reason why those boxes are shaped differently is it's meant to suggest that once you have the infrastructure it's there for any domain and you know maybe the first one is is just getting a pipeline into production maybe the second one is is the ability to support transactions which is not just an acid transaction but you have to have some way to manage constraints like shackle and things like that <clears throat> so each each increment here is 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 growing a base capability where the the blue stuff is is expanding the domain footprint. So I'm going to wrap it up and take questions here in a second. Um, you know the overall trend I think is there's no avoiding this. It, this stuff's being hyped now. It's being talked about everywhere we go. Um, I I like to tell people there's actually a shortcut from the top of this thing you don't have to go through the trough you know there is a shortcut over there to the plateau of enlightenment or plateau of productivity um and which is, is essentially a lot of what i was just saying in these in these steps you don't you don't have to plunge you know the, the trough of disillusionment usually is caused by a whole bunch of people showing up who don't know what they're doing and and want to pad their resume with whatever's at the top of the hype cycle and then it doesn't work out and people get uh you know, upset, but and that's what causes the trough. But you don't have to do that. You can just skip over it and go on there. And then my uh, my three my three trends in summary. One, you know, the all these these giant companies that everyone envies uh, are totally capitalizing on knowledge graph, and people are noticing that and 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 want saying, you know, why can't we have this and let's have that. I think the second one is that people are noticing what's going on with linked open data and either want to use it as a resource, but often as not just use it as an inspiration and say, look, if they can do that, we should be able to do that. Let's go link our internal data in that same way. And actually the bonus is if you do that, as it's time to link to external data, you know, you know how to do it. It's, it's, it's easy now. And then the last one is, um, what, what's really happening in enterprises now is, is get a good pilot, start building it out and start recognizing as you do this, this is a long self-funding journey. Um, it's gonna involve evolving an architecture in parallel with a model and you know, you're gonna have to have a sponsor to get that done. So with that, I'll pause and take questions. <laughs>